Okay, bit of a different video this time. This is a video in final preparation for the Summer 22 uh, Advanced Guidance Paper for GCSE Computer Science. And so we won't be covering 1.5, but we'll be looking over 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, 1 and 1.6. And I'm trying to find uh, questions, exam questions that match up to the guidance. Now, I'm not saying this is going to prepare you for the whole thing, but if you've got a one-stop place to go to get ready before the final exam, this is not a bad place to look at. So we're going to go through each exam question, kicking off 1.1 now. So, um, looking at this first question, it says we need to look at system architecture, and in this context, it's the purpose of the CPU. Now, this question doesn't directly talk about the purpose of the CPU, but fundamentally, you can talk about the purpose, something along the lines of to process instructions, to process instructions and data, uh, and it identifies four events that take place in the fetch execute cycle. Now, it's got a bit missing there. What would you normally describe it as? You describe it as the, what's the three parts of the cycle? The, the, the what? Yeah, fetch, fetching, and then you've got, what's next? So you've got fetch, decode, and then finally you've got the execute part of it. Brilliant. What is being fetched, decoded, and executed? What is being fetched? Instructions. Absolutely. Thank you, Sarah. Instructions are being fetched. They need to be decoded because what are these, what are these instructions going to be held in, Ruben? What are they going to be held in? Yeah, but what, what, you're right, they're held in memory. I should have asked it better. Um, what are they going to look like? It's computer, so what's the computer going to understand? Binary, right? So they're in binary, they're in ones and zeros, so the computer is not going to understand how to be able to use it. At the control unit, it would have to decode that instruction, find out whether it's to add, to take away, to output, whatever, and then finally to execute. To execute to means to... Well, to, to do it, right? To execute that command. And then, obviously, it's going to repeat in section over section. So let's have a look at these answers. How about we kick off the journey by saying something like this? What was fetched? And where did Ruben say the instruction was fetched from? Memory. So an instruction's fetched from memory will be a good first point. Brilliant. After it's been fetched, the next part of the cycle is it will need to be decoded. You might mention that that's done by the control unit. I'm looking at the mark screen. It doesn't specify it. I might chuck that in. <clears throat> I put in this phrase CU. CU is short for the control unit, which helps manage that fetch, decode, execute cycle, but is the decoding part. Uh, next in our cycle, we would say that it executes. And I would probably say something in addition uh, uh, is that it will be executed at the, what part of the CPU? The, go on? ALU, absolutely. So instruction is then executed at the ALU. Awesome. How many marks do you think I've got? How many marks is it out of? So there are a few ways you can get the additional mark. Here's the easiest. It's a cycle, so therefore the cycle needs to repeat. You get a mark for just saying that. Now, there are other elements that could be available. I'll just mention them because we're going to do registers in a second, so I'll just say them. You could say that the program counter is incremented, and we'll talk about the program counter in a moment, but remember it holds the address of the next instruction to be fetched. You could say that the instruction is transferred to the MDR, so the contents of the, what's held in the memory is put into the MDR, and then you can also say that the MAR might hold the address um, of the value for the instruction, but we'll, we'll do that in the next bit here. Okay, awesome. So we're looking at the chief components of a CPU. Let's be honest, we get a question like this, and that's four marks right there. That's pretty nice. Question like this, my strategy is nearly always, what are the really obvious ones, the ones that you're confident about, do them first, and then work backwards. So I'll give you two minutes right now, have a look at it, see what you think. So these are the core components. Like I say, we will work from the ones that we're pretty confident about. There are four parts, five definitions, so there's the odd one out. Um, performs mathematical operations. Hey, as soon as I see that, what am I thinking? I'm thinking, what am I thinking? Performs mathematical operations. AOU, arithmetic logic unit all day. There we go. Uh, send signals to direct the operations. Keeps the clock in sync. Send signals to direct the operation. What's the bit that's, I'm trying to not use the word, manages the fetch to code execute cycle? What bit's that? What's managing the fetch to code execute cycle? Control unit. So for that one, we're saying control unit is sends uh, signals to direct the operations. 
<clears throat> keeps the clock in sync would be the internal clock. Do we have that here? So I think we've seen our boogeyman, potentially. A small piece, or the red herring, a small piece of memory inside the processor that can hold one instruction or address. Ah, now, when you, see, when you read small piece of memory, could that be cache? Yeah, because it's relatively small, but can cache hold more than one instruction? Yeah, cache could hold, so cache might be eight megabytes in size, for instance. So it could hold thousands of instructions, ultimately. Yes, it's tiny in comparison to RAM, but there's something that, has, that can hold one. Think about the program counter, think about the memory address register. How much stuff does it hold? It holds one. So uh, for that one, it's a register is a small piece of memory inside the processor that can hold one instruction. Then finally, high-speed memory, which would describe uh, register, because registers are very high speed, inside the processor that stores recently used instructions. Right, there you go. Then that is cache all day. That is ugly. My apologies. I tried to make that nice and failed. Okay, so if you want to learn a bit more about the registers in detail, because it's a trickier part, if you watch my video 1.1 on system architecture, it's there. I've got a separate video that's just on the registers as well that's worth watching if you're not sure. Essentially, it's talking about registers that are used in the von Neumann architecture. We can have a little list. What are the different registers we could be talking about? We could talk about the PC, which stands for program counter. We could talk about the MAR, which is the memory address register. We can talk about the MDR, memory data register. And then the final one we've got here is accumulator. There we go. Now, uh, just a way of defining these things, splitting up a little bit. Which one of these? So some of these are going to hold data. Some of them are going to hold instructions. Some of them are going to hold addresses. Which one of these are going to hold addresses? Memory address register definitely going to hold addresses. What's the other one that's going to hold an address? Program counters. So these two hold addresses. Could they ever hold data or instructions? No. It's exclusively addresses. What about memory data register? Could be data, could be an instruction. So that could be data or an instruction in the MDR. What about the accumulator? What does that hold? The results of calculations. Is the result of a calculation ever going to be an instruction? No. It's going to be, what is it going to be? data. So the MDR could be, so program counter and memory address register are always holding addresses. The MDR could be holding an instruction or data. And the accumulator is always going to be holding data, which is the result of a calculation, right? So that, that, well, there you go. That's my brief overview. Let's, uh, let's cut to the chase. Hey, which ones do you feel confident about? question like this is not the time to sort of pick your weakest one. Let's pick the one we feel confident about. So we're saying accumulator. So let's do that one first. So describe the purpose of the two registers. Uh, guess what? How many marks do you say just for saying a register? That's one mark straight away. Easy money, right? So you say both registers, that'd be two marks out of the four. What do we say the accumulator does? Stores the results of, of like processes, calculations. Yeah. Uh, after that, what should we say? Program counter, maybe? Yes? What did we say a program counter held? Did it hold instructions, data, or addresses? Addresses. It holds the address. Holds the address of what? Of the, of the next instruction to be fetched. While we're here, I'll just say them in case it came up. Uh, where was my overview? Here we go. Memory address register. Uh, I'll give you the... Uh, the approved exam board answer stores the address uh, stores the address the location of data or an instruction uh, MDR stores the data or instruction that is fetched from memory okay so I mean me you know that original thing I just did was said it could hold data and that actually covers most of it in fact that summary basically is all you need to say the name of it and does it hold an address or does it hold instructional data? All right, fantastic. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so now we're in 1.2. Like I say, I'm not saying we fully covered 1.1. I'm just giving that brief overview. 1.1, memory and storage. Inside here, we're talking about things like RAM, ROM, virtual memory, secondary storage, uh, 
and all the stuff around binary, hexadecimal, logical shifts, image representation, sound representation, compression. A 1.2 is big. So, um, Gareth, believe it or not, this is just an exam question. You know you've become old when your name is used as, anyway, that's not my official name, it's TLDR. Uh, has a suitable navigation system, has a satellite, Jesus, has a satellite navigation system, satnav, in his car that uses RAM and ROM. So it's using a combination of RAM and ROM. List some characteristics of computer memory, one box in each row to show whether each of the statements is true for RAM or ROM. Hey, let's talk big picture. When we're talking about RAM and ROM, what do we say? So RAM, when you turn the power off, what happens to RAM? It all empties, and we refer to that by a term beginning with V, volatile. So RAM is volatile because when you turn the power off, the contents is lost, which is what you might do in a sat-nav. Uh, with ROM, when you turn the power off, what happens? It retains all those values, and that's referred to as non-volatile. So that's the first thing. Second thing, what does ROM actually stand for? Read-only read memory. Can you write to ROM? No. So it's read-only. So you can't update it or change it, whereas with RAM read and write to it those realistically are the big things that you need to care about for here so um why don't you take a moment have a look at these questions i'm going to give you maybe 30 seconds pause the video attempt these questions okay so <clears throat> we just have to go through each of these statements and review them we've got stores the boot up sequence of the sat nav stores the boot up sequence of the sat nav so when we boot up it means the device has been switched off right so if it's switched off, what's held in RAM when it's been turned off? <coughs> Nothing. So the boot up cannot possibly be in RAM, right? Because it would be empty. So therefore, the boot up would be in ROM. There you go, all day. The contents are lost when the sat nav is turned off. So that may, might be your current uh, route you've picked or something, potentially. Or, you know, uh, if it's lost when it's turned off, it will be RAM. <clears throat> this is holds the copies of open maps and routes. Now that this might be the bit that seems a bit trickier. Uh, do you think map? Do you think the like the maps and stuff? Oh, I don't know. That is a trickier one because ultimately the map might not update. It might be the same one from before. But the phrase "open" currently running programs. Currently running programs are held in the RAM. So if I was uh, thinking about this, I'd say, because it's the currently open one, I would say it's in RAM. Because you might need to, because is the route always going to be the same route for everybody? You're going to pick your individual route, right? And if you're picking an individual route, that's going to have to be written to, the, to it. And if you write to it, can it be written to the ROM? It cannot. I think what it means by copies is that it might actually be in ROM, the original thing of it, but the copy of it that you're currently using is in RAM. I don't like this question, if I'm going to be honest with you. I feel like it's a little bit ambiguous. Um, I'm looking at the mark scheme. The mark scheme is looking for RAM in this context. I suppose, yeah, the copy is, because an embedded system, which is not on the thing, but an embedded system, where are the instructions held? In ROM and not in secondary storage. So what, I guess what it's saying is that, let's say you want to currently do a, a map, a route. It might take, the, the map might be held in ROM, although that means you can never update it, which is kind of sucks, but let's say it is. And then you copy it into RAM to actively use it. Yeah. All right, anyway, let's continue. So now we're looking at this concept of primary storage. Primary storage is storage where your CPU can fetch from it directly. So can your... Uh, in our fetch to code execute cycle that we discussed previously, can you fetch instructions from cache? Yes, you can. Can you fetch instructions from RAM? Yes, you can. Can you fetch instructions directly from your hard drive? No. They need to be loaded, which is why you see that load screen, into RAM ready to be fetched, which is why things like mechanical hard drives, Blu-rays, Flash, they're all considered secondary storage while uh, RAM, in this case, is going to be considered primary. So a computer only has two gigabytes of memory. What is a gigabyte? A thousand megabytes. That's correct. And a megabyte is a, a million bytes or a thousand kilobytes. So you could say gigabytes a billion of something, megabytes a, uh, a million, kilo or something is a thousand. Uh, what ones I've got missing? It actually is coming up later. I've got units on here. Terra is a trillion. 
and Peta is a quadrillion. That's a lot of something. All right, anyway. Uh, Alicia says that virtual memory can be used instead of adding more RAM. So RAM, we said it's two properties earlier, which is that it can be, uh, it's volatile and that you can read and write to it. But it's used because you can read and write to it. That's not the best drawing I've ever done. It's used to hold currently running programs. So if you can visualize this as my RAM that's currently filling up, uh, this could be, I don't know, this could be my, well, what's some of the things that you have in ROM? Uh, in RAM, Jesus. What's the some of the things you're going to have in RAM? What? Huh? Open applications. And to even make them work, you're going to need what? An operating system. So components of your operating system must be loaded. Don't care if it's on my iPad, my laptop, phone, whatever. Operating system. And then, as you say, currently running applications. So I don't know. Maybe this could be uh, Dreamweaver I'm adding in. Um, I could be having tabs that I've got open in Chrome. Actually, it's Chrome, so it's going to be like massive, obviously. Uh, and then, not by mouth in Chrome. Don't come for me, Google. I'm your friend. Um, and it fills it up. And eventually, what's going to happen to RAM? You're filling it up with operating system, currently running applications and data, and then you've got no more space, right? And that's where your computer could say, hey, your RAM is full. Stop opening things. Close something first. But it doesn't do that. What does it do? Yeah, it makes use of virtual memory. So virtual memory is when it takes a section of your secondary storage. This is my mechanical hard drive. Look, I can actually draw a perfect circle. Isn't that crazy? And uh, it takes a section of it, so uh, in here, and then it pretends that it's memory. So it's going to pretend that that's memory. Is it memory? No, it's virtual memory. And because I want to load PowerPoint or something, I need to move one of these apps over here. Uh, in fact, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll move th this app over here. So it's got moved over. Why am I moving this one? Because it's not currently active. Freeing up the space here, and meaning that I can put in my new app, which is, uh, I'm really hip, RDR2, Red Dead Redemption 2. It's a classic. When you guys get to the age of 18, you'll get to play it. It's great. When you're 18. No, you're not. You're, maybe you're virtual. You're virtual avatars 18, maybe. I don't know. OK. Uh, so at a later point, if I want to load this app back, can I just load it directly from here? Can I fetch things directly from secondary storage? No. So I'd have to swap this back over for me to open it. Is that going to be a fast process? No. So it's going to allow me to open more applications, but it's going to be slow me down. Make sense? All right. Let's have a go at the actual question. Explain how virtual memory can compensate for the lack of RAM in Alicia's computer. So you'll need to be talking about the fact that RAM can become full. You're going to want to talk about the fact that a proportion of your secondary storage, like your hard disk, is taken to mimic memory. You can talk about the fact that applications that are not currently you're using or using less actively are being moved to the virtual memory, freeing up space to allow her to use uh, her apps here. And why it would be beneficial for Alicia to get more RAM instead of relying on virtual memory? Hey, big picture, why is the what is the advantage of having more RAM? If I had more RAM, when I wanted to load Red Redemption 2, what would be different? Would I have to have moved this over here? No, this could have stayed here, and I could have just added it in directly. So having more RAM. Now, after a certain point, of course, if my RAM is absolutely massive up here somewhere, and I never get further than here, then obviously adding more RAM is not going to be helpful. All right, people, why don't you have a go at trying to answer that question? OK, then, so let's revisit this question. Um, so it's all about virtual memory and RAM is what we care about. So when do we use uh, virtual memory? Well, we use virtual memory when what's happened? When RAM is full. So virtual memory is used when RAM is full. What is virtual memory? That's the next thing we have to say. So virtual memory is what? Is yeah, is when we use part of the secondary storage as a temporary store. Yeah. I'm saying virtual memory is when we use a part of secondary storage as memory. How do we use it? Well, we use applications that are less actively required. We move them to where? We move them from RAM to secondary storage. Why did we do this? Why did we move lower priority data to the virtual memory? to free up space so we can load things into RAM.
Beautiful. Explain why it would be beneficial to get more RAM instead. So what's the limitations? What's the limitations of the virtual memory? Yeah, absolutely. So because virtual memory is ultimately secondary storage, and secondary storage is a lot slower than RAM, it's more beneficial to have more RAM so then you wouldn't have to swap it into secondary storage. So I'll say something like, so I'm going to say RAM is much faster than virtual memory, so faster to put data into RAM uh, uh, and moving, uh, yeah, the more RAM you have, the less you need to use virtual memory. Beautiful. Right, let's go to the next question. So on here, we have Vicky. Vicky's been on a holiday and has taken lots of photos. The memory in her camera is now full and she needs to transfer her photos to an external secondary storage device. Remember, these second storage devices, these are the more permanent ways of holding information. Now, is secondary storage, is that going to be volatile or non-volatile? Non-volatile, absolutely. Imagine if they were volatile, every time you turn your computer off or your hard drive blanked, or every time you turn your phone off, as in powered it down, it would lose it. That would suck. So they're all non-volatile. State four characteristics of secondary storage that the Vicky should consider when choosing a device. So these are the, it's not asking you to imply them at this point, but these are things, so maybe it's worth taking a moment to think, what are the three categories? What are the three categories of secondary storage? Anybody remember? No, but I'm saying the categories, first of all. You're right that that's a factor. So the three types of secondary storage. So solid state or flash. Those are the three types of secondary storage. So it fits inside here. Solid state could be an SSD drive, could also be a flash, like USB flash drive. That it's all the same tech. Optical, that could be CD or Blu-ray or DVDs, the same tech, but just at different concentrations and speeds and densities of data. And magnetic, really it's your magnetic hard drive, but it could also be magnetic tape, for instance. All right, and typically, they kind of have a trade-off. Why don't we just have one? Because they've got different advantages and, disadvantages and disadvantages to each other. So this is the fastest, typically. So if it's the fastest, that could be one speed, could be one of the factors we care about. How about this? Which one do you think is going to be the most expensive per gigabyte? Which one's the most expensive per gigabyte, do you reckon, Henry? So I agree with you. Yeah, solid state is typically per gigabyte is going to be the most expensive. The least expensive per gigabyte will be either magnetic hard drives or potentially Blu-ray actually is probably quite cheap per gigabyte, but then of course you can't have the trade-off with that site. So you can have cost could be a factor, speed could be a factor. How about capacity? Like I want to hold, like let's say um, CDs are really quite cheap, but they only go up to 700 megabytes. I want to hold, I don't know, 100 gigabytes worth of data. I'd have to like burn like 150 CDs. That's not going to be very useful. So you might want to consider what the capacity could be. Now, um, Vicky had memory in her camera. Uh, a magnetic hard drive is big and bulky, but has great storage. So why don't we stick that inside a camera? So it's not very portable because it's big and bulky. So it's going to make your whole camera bigger. So um, that's going to be an issue. Also, it's got moving parts, right? So if I'm moving that around and shaking it, what could happen to it? Break it. So the durability. So what we got? We've had speed, cost, uh, durability, reliability. Yeah, I think we've got more actually. So I'm going to write them all down in case in the future we're asked to talk about one of them specifically. So yeah, these are the official ones. The only one we haven't talked about that's actually on the mark scheme is reliability which is kind of related to durability, right? It's like, what's the likelihood that it would actually break and it'll be, you know, keep going? And that could be different, like a CD, if you shake it around, is the CD gonna break? No, you scratch it, yeah. So, um, you know, it's a little bit uh, a different one. Oh, and we've answered the other question, haven't we already? Identify the three common storage technologies Vicky can choose from. What are the three common ones they can choose from? Solid state, optical, and magnetic. Yeah, there's three marks right there. Now, here's where people often go wrong in this kind of question. Do some people write down things like a Blu-ray? Do people write down magnetic, um, a hard drive? They totally do. 
these kind of questions, when it comes up, you want to put in, if you're talking about a secondary storage device, you want to say magnetic, or you want to say solid state, or you want to say optical, okay? So I'm not going to write it in here, we just literally did that. So on this one here, we have a Poo who has a handheld ebook reader that allows him to store and read electronic books. We're still in secondary storage here. A Poo gets a free ebook on a CD ROM from a magazine. So, uh, CD ROM being what type of technology it is? It is non volatile, but what category? Optical. CD is optical, yeah, because it optical uses light. In fact, CD ROM, uh, CDs use. Uh, uh, yeah, CD-ROMs use just light I think DVDs use infrared light and Blu-rays use lasers because it's about the precision of how big that wavelength is All right. give two reasons why a CD-ROM is suitable in this case so what do we have to talk about? what did we just literally talk about? we talked about the different factors is the CD-ROM going to be expensive per CD-ROM? is that going to be an advantage? yeah is the CD-ROM going to be portable? Now, a CD-ROM player is not portable, but the CD itself could be very easily portable. So you need to be thinking about those kind of factors. Uh, state whether CD-ROM is magnetic, optical, or solid state. Well, why don't I give you a moment? I've got to try and answer these questions. So we literally just reviewed the different types of factors. So let's apply them here. CD-ROM, well, put it this way. Why wouldn't you put an SD card or a solid state, card, solid state drive on the front of a magazine? That'd be really expensive. Right? That could be a few pounds every single time. Uh, that is not, for a free ebook, it's going to cost you, the person doing it, use your if you use your business brain. So cost, I think, is a big factor. So it's cheap to produce. So cost, cheap to produce. For me, the other factor, and I think we were discussing that, is that it's got portability. It's got good portability. Um, state whether a CD-ROM is magnetic, optical, or solid state. We literally just did that. It is, what is it? Optical. Okay, in order, smallest to largest. What's the smallest? What do you reckon? A bit. So a bit is going to be an individual one or zero. So I'm going to put a one next to it. Probably you should have to write this out. I'm going to say it's a one for bit. After that, a bit is just a single one or zero. What do you reckon, Archie, after that? Four ones or zeros, otherwise known as a... Nibble, that's exactly right, Platon. Uh, two. Uh, after that, eight bits make a... Hey, Carlos, what do eight bits make? Eight bits make a... Eight bit makes a... Byte. Thank you, man. And then we've got... MB, short for... Megabyte. GB short for gigabyte, PB short for petabyte. So after byte, we've got the next biggest one would be, the next biggest one would normally be kilobyte. Is kilobyte there? Nope. After that, it will be a megabyte. After that, it will be a, after that, it will be a petabyte. Because that's a million bytes, a billion bytes. No, sorry. Yeah, a million bytes a billion bytes, and that is a quadrillion, because it should be gigabyte, then terabyte, and then petabyte, but there's no, it's not there. Beautiful. This one here is just a uh, opportunity to practice all these different types of questions. There's more to it than that, but we've got denary into binary, we've got binary into hexadecimal, we've got a binary shift, and we've got a shift used to do this thing here. It's a selection, it's, it's uh, a few, it's like, what, seven marks? Yeah, seven marks. Um, almost guaranteed, you're gonna have to do some combination of these, and these ones, you're gonna have to wanna get full marks. Not getting full marks to a question like this, be ruinous. So, first question we've got here is converting uh, denary number of 132. By denary, we mean our number system, counting in tens. It's saying we need to convert that into binary, into an 8-bit binary number, and we just did that 8 bits is a byte. Now, as a reminder, when we talk about these kind of questions, if it's denary, we're counting in lots of 10. So it's just units, 1, 10s, 100s. If I want to put the number 364, right, it's just units like this. But because binary doesn't go up in 10s, it goes up in 2s, 
the first thing you want to do for any of these questions is draw this little grid out. Now go one, two, four, eight, and you see what's happening is instead of going up by tens that you do in denary, it goes up in twos for binary. So for the binary question here, because it's eight bits, I'll have to write out the grid up to uh, the eighth bit. So one, two, four, eight. So I've done the first four bits. 16, keep doubling it, 32, 64, and finally 128. Now where some people go wrong with this kind of question is they actually, at the exam, decide to do it the other way around and go one, two, four, eight, okay? It's always in this order, right? And if you're like, oh, how can I remember that? Well, imagine doing units like we've just done here and you actually do units the other way around and you go lots of ones, lots of tens, lots of hundreds, and lots of thousands. If I gave you a number like 3,416, well, that would now become 6,143. You're literally reading it all backwards. So uh, it's that way around. We want to turn 132 into binary. We start on the left. We say, does 128 fit into 132? Answer is yes. Okay? So we put a 1. Putting 1 is like putting a switch on. And now we've poured out 128 away from the 132. So we can take 132, take away 128, leaving us with 4. And then we say, can 64 go into 4? No, it can't. Can 32 go into 4? No. 16 can't go into 4. 8 can't go into 4. Can 4 go into 4? Yes, it can. So instead of writing zero, we'd write down one. And we have to allocate that that's happened. So four take away four leaves us with zero. Can two go into zero? Can one go into zero? No. And there we are. Now, the next one, it's saying hexadecimal. Remember, hexadecimal is when we use a number system. It's never stored as hexadecimal in a computer, but it makes it much easier for human beings to communicate binary to each other. Because basically, one nibble, which is four bits, is worth exactly one hexadecimal digit. So I'm just going to write out it again here, but a little bit larger. So one, zero, one, one, zero, one, zero, one. That's this number here I've put down. To turn it into hexadecimal, you split it into nibbles. So I'm literally going to split it now into these two nibbles. And then I'm going to say one, two, four, eight. In fact, actually, why don't I just write on top of here? One, two, four, eight. Same here. One, two, four, eight. The first uh, digit, the first hexadecimal digit, will be eight plus two plus one, which would make eleven. The second one will be four and one, which would make five. But here's the deal: in hexadecimal, as soon as we get to ten, it becomes a. So eleven will become b. So the answer to this is b. Five, right next to each other like that. Next, we've got the idea of shifting. A binary shift to the right of two places of this number. So I'm going to write the original number in. So the original number is 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0. And we want to shift it 2 to the right. That means we literally move everything over by 2. So uh, these two they're going to get shifted completely out, right? Because they're going to get shifted outside. They're going to go what's called a underflow. And what's going to happen is that the rest, one, zero, you see this bit? Anyway, I'll, I'll highlight it in a second. That this bit here in yellow is now shifted two to the right. You see that? This bit here, in, this bit here I put in green, well, that's kind of fallen off the edge. That's what's called an underflow. Now, originally we had an 8-bit number. Do we have an 8-bit number now? So in these two here, these two spots here, uh, this is the kind of question defining what a character set, where sometimes people don't get all the marks, um, mainly because 
um, they'll say something like, it's the characters that exist or the symbols that exist. Generally don't use characters because characters are in the uh, question. But you have to say that a computer understands. So I would say in here, I'd have two parts to it. First part I would say is uh, the combination of symbols. And you know what? I might even say on this, not even just symbols. I might just say, of you know, such as letters, numbers, etc. And then the second part is that a computer understands. That second part is really crucial. Uh, that second part is really crucial. So the next question here, when sending text messages using a mobile phone, people can choose from hundreds of characters called emoji. To insert in their message, an example of an emoji is this. Oh, it's like a little bear or something. The Unicode character for the, I think I've just written on there, my bad. For the emoji, the little bear, in hexadecimal is 1F64A. Convert the hexadecimal 1464A to binary. The first three hexadecimal digits have been done for you. So we need to find basically what 4 is and what A is. Now we said earlier A is actually the value 10. What would I do? Each hexadecimal digit is worth what? A nibble. So I do the little grid. So to do four in binary, what would you make it, Archie? So how, okay, well, it's, can you put four into binary? Are there any, can you put eight into four? Can you put eight into four? And instead of saying no, because it's binary, it's one or a zero. So you say zero. Can you put four into four? Yes, instead of, instead of uh, one, and then four take away four leaves us with zero. So can you put two into zero? Can you put one into zero? So do you see there that that is basically what it's going to be in binary? And then have a go at trying to make sure you can do that with 10 as well. Okay, and to do 10 then, Archie, how do we do it? So what combination of these numbers will add to 10? 8 and 2. And so would you use 4 and 1? There you go. Simple as that. So the answer would be one zero one zero. Finally, explain why mobile phones can send emojis would use Unicode as opposed to ASCII. Now ASCII, do you remember they're both character sets? Do you remember what the limitation for ASCII is? Yeah, so it's either seven or eight bit. Whoops. 7 or 8 bit, which means it's either going to have between, well, it's 127 characters if it's 8 bit plus 1 for null, so 127 slash 128, and then it's double that for extended ASCII with 256. But either way, it only really has if enough numbers and letters combinations to have the English language, so capital A, lowercase, uh, you know, all that. So if we want more, you'd have to have Unicode. So the answer would be something like, which, well, which one has ability to have more characters Unicode so Unicode has um, capacity for more characters what is the actual limitation of ASCII so ASCII was yeah so ASCII was ASCII is 7 slash 8 bits uh, while Unicode can be 16 bits there's even bigger versions on the side yeah so that's saying yeah for 7 bit there's 127 slash 128 characters it's 127 characters plus the null which makes 128 depends how you ask so double 256 or 255 plus the null 256 and with ASCII like I said the issue is it's 7 or 8 bits it's limited and then you've got uh, Unicode can go up to 16. With that, there's bigger versions. But 16 bits gives you 65,536 combinations. So that's a, that's a lot. Okay, so we're now looking at storage of images. We looked at storage of characters, of uh, denary numbers, of hexadecimal. We now looked at images. 
Um, the way we need to learn about it is not vector images, we're all looking at bitmap images. And a bitmap, like here, is made up of individual what? What's the smallest part of a bitmap? Pixels. Individual pixels with different colors. And we're going to use those combination of pixels together to uh, show our image. There are two factors that improve the quality of an image. Do you know what the two factors are? So they'll contribute to... Sorry, color depth, absolutely. So first one is color depth. With color depth, it's how many colors you can display. The more colors you can display, the higher the quality of the image. Downside? Bigger file size, absolutely. The other one is the resolution, which is the amount of pixels we're using. Higher resolution, sharper image. In this case, what is, how many colors can we display here? See here? Look here, it's, it, they've got a little table. Seven. Seven colors, right? Now, is the color depth going to be seven? Isn't it? One, two, three, four, five, six. Jesus, I can't count. Thank you, Usman. I'm glad that you're here. Six colors. Now, is the color depth six? No, go on then. How do you figure out the color depth? So it's the number of bits that you'll use for the colors. All right, that's the bit that people trip up on this one. So if we said that the color depth was one bit, how many different combinations could you have? Zero or one. Because zero could be white, one could be blue. So you have two colors. If I had two bit, how many different combinations can I get? How many? Four. I feel on dodgy ground talking about numbers now. Yes? What's going to happen? Every time I add a bit, what's going to happen to the number of colors? It will double. So if I've got six colors, I've got six colors, how, what's the color depth I'm going to need? Three bit, right? And then I just won't use two of the colors. All right. So it'll be three bit color depth. I'm just I'm like forecasting ahead a little bit. So in here, use an example, explain how the bitmap image is stored on a computer. So what, is an I what do we say an image is made up of? Pixels. So that's our first. What is the pixel going to be made out of? So each of it's going to be made out of bits, and it's going to have a unique color. It's going to have its own color, right? So each pixel. Now, I'm saying each pixel would describe a single color. I'm not saying other pixels won't have the same color I'm saying but that individual pixel is just a single dot of color and then uh, it's referring to figure two so if it's referring to figure two should we use that in our example yeah. definitely so what you should say so we could say uh, I don't know um, the top left pixel would be white or something let me see what's on the mark scheme uh, yeah, you got mark, two marks for an example explanation. So we got that, and then one mark for an example. Uh, so, so we could say, for instance, white could be zero zero zero. Yeah. Awesome. Explain how reducing the number of colors in an image can reduce the color file size. Yeah. So, I'd relate it to this one here because we've got an example. When you got an example. Uh, so we could say something like, in this example, the six colors would require a color depth of three bits. If I reduce the number of colors to five, would that reduce the color? Uh, would that reduce, re reduce the file size? No. If I reduce it by two, would it reduce the file size? Yeah, because then four colors wouldn't meet. So if we reduce the colors by two, then you'd have four colors and would only require a color depth of two bits. Run out of space for that a little bit. So if you reduce to four colors, you would have two bit color depth, which will mean that every pixel you reduce by one bit. So instead of costing two, three bits for every pixel, now it reduces by uh, two bits for every pixel. <clears throat> and then finally, metadata. Remember, metadata is any data that's there in addition, in addition to the raw data that makes it up. So the ones and zeros that make up the image, the colors, that's not metadata. 
but anything else in addition is metadata. How about the dimensions of the file? So how wide it is and how tall it is? That's metadata. So because, and you, without metadata, you can't literally can't even show the thing. So an example could be, uh, so we're saying, what are we saying? We're saying any additional information than the raw ones and zeros. We can say, for instance, you know, in this case, uh, the, um, the image dimensions. Uh, what else? You could talk about uh, date modified. I know that's generic to all files, but do you see that's in addition to it? You could say location, like, you know, when you take a photograph, for instance, location, image taken. Right, all of that is metadata. There's, uh, although, there's actually a lot more metadata in terms of that stuff. On an image, 99% of the image will be the raw data that makes up the ones and zeros that show it, and then 1% will be the image data. But there's actually quite a lot of image data that will be taken with it. Okay, so this is the final part of the types of data that we need to be able to record and discuss sound. And it's about taking the analog world we hear with uh, sound waves and then turning it into a bunch of ones and zeros. Uh, I'll do a quick, so the way it works is that I've got an analog sound wave like this and I need to turn this smooth wave, need to take this smooth wave and turn it into a bunch of ones and zeros. How do I do that? Well, I do that by the process of sampling. So I record the amplitude, aka the height of the wave as I go along. I keep recording it, I keep sampling the height of the wave. Two factors that matter about it. One factor is called the uh, sample frequency. It's how often I'm sampling it, and we measure that in hertz. 10 hertz means I'm sampling 10 times a second, etc. Um, so as I'm going along, I'm sampling it. The more often I'm sampling it, the higher the quality of the audio. The downside is the more often I'm recording it, the bigger the sound file will ultimately become and on the other side I've got on the other side I've got bit depth which is essentially how many different levels I can record it at so the more the, the more number of bits I commit Sikanda to it the more precisely I can map the wave okay that's the deal anyway so this one here explain how sampling is used to store audio recordings so the first thing is we're saying what is being sampled the, what do I refer to this as? The, the height or amplitude of the wave is sampled on the way, is sampled. When we record the height of the wave, we're going to need to turn it into something. It's bit depth, so what's it going to be recorded in? It's going to be recorded in... Absolutely. So this is converted to, uh, uh, to binary bits. So that's the bit depth. What was the other factor that matters with sampling? What was the other one? How frequently I did it. Yes? So this is taken at intervals determined by the, what was the factor? There you go. So this sampling happens at intervals determined by the sample frequency. Okay. And then a second interview with the computer scientist is recorded. Before this interview, the sampling frequency of the audio software is increased. So sampling frequency, remember here, is just how frequently we're sampling the height of the wave. So the more often we sample this wave, the height of the wave, the higher the quality of the audio recording. So when we're asking to define what sample frequency means, well, that's quite straightforward. It's the number of samples taken per second. And in general, we could say it's how often a sample is taken. Finally, we've been asked to review these boxes and two of the boxes we will need to tick. So we need to read through each of these and then decide where the ones are most appropriate. Okay, pause the video and give that a go. So let's go through these in turn. The file size of the digital recording will be smaller if we increase the sample frequency. Well, if we're increasing the sample frequency, 
we're literally going to increase the number of ones and zeros because every time we take a sample of the height we'll need to contribute depending on the bit depth ones and zeros so it won't be this one it won't be the top one However, it is going to be larger, right? Because we're going to be using more ones and zeros. The quality of the playback of the digital recording will be better. It's absolutely the case. The more often you sample it, the closer it will be to the original analog wave, and therefore the quality will be higher. And the final one, the quality will be worse. Nope, it will not be worse. Okay, we're on to compression now. Layla is an artist. She draws images by hand. The image is then scanned and stored on a computer, and Layla uploads her images and videos to a website. Explain why Layla compresses the images and videos before uploading them. So if you're uploading to a server, that's gonna take, it's gonna have a certain amount of capacity, a certain amount of space. When you compress a file, remember you're going to shrink the size of that original file. That's the goal of it. And so it will reduce the file size which means it will take up less space on the server. Are there any other implications? Well, if the file size is smaller, well, that means it's going to be faster for you to upload it to the server. And guess what? In the future, it's going to be faster for other people to download it from the server. OK, Layla wants to reduce the file size of the images and videos by the largest amount possible. Identify the method of compression that would be the most appropriate and justify your choice. Now remember, the goal of all compression is that you start with an original file of zeros and ones. You know, maybe it's an image, maybe it's a sound file, maybe it's a text file. And then via the method of compression, you are going to shrink that file into a smaller version, literally requiring less ones and zeros. That's the goal of all compression. Afterwards, there's two outcomes dependent on the style of compression you used. If you used lossless compression, then you, uh, when you decompress this, you return to the original. So when you use lossless compression, you end up with the complete copy of the original. When you use lossy compression techniques, well, that's a bit different. You actually will permanently lose some. So it will come back to something like the original, but some data will be permanently lost. So it's not an exact match. You use lossless compression for things like text or programming code. Lossy, because you're losing some of the data, it's when you are not going to notice the difference. So you might use it for image compression or video compression. You can imagine if you're using lossless compression, you're going to end up having a smaller file, or having a larger file, because if you're not losing anything with lossless compression, you can't compress it as much. With lossy compression, because you're losing it permanently, then you compress it a lot more. In this context, we have images and videos, which are going to be very large files. And they want to compress it by the largest amount possible. Because you want to compress it the most, and because it's a, a video and an image, you can make use of uh, lossy as a file reduction technique. Would we want to make use of lossy? Well, first of all, lossy is, the most like, is going to be the most likely to reduce the file by a large amount. If you remember from our previous discussion, even though data has been lost permanently, with something like an image, ones and zeros could disappear, but you don't actually notice the difference because you can't perceive it. Maybe it's some of the shades of the color of blue that's disappeared, but you can't perceive that, dif that difference. So lossy will remove data that is not noticeable. We're now moving to the topic of networks, 1.3 networks. And we're gonna first consider performance. When we talk about performance, we think about terms like bandwidth, the amount of bits transferable in a second. And we can think about different ways that we could transfer it, maybe over wired connections like Ethernet. And in general, that will give you a higher performance than technologies such as Wi-Fi, which is wireless. Now, ultimately, you could have situations where one's faster than the other. But in general, it's, it's easier to say that wireless has got higher performance, wired has higher performance than wireless. 
in this question, it's asking you to consider the differences between uh, the difference of Wi-Fi in a house, depending on where you are uh, using a device. Uh, this is something that I dare say most of you will have had experienced in your homes. So Hope has a network in her house. The main devices are shown in the diagram. So we have a laptop up in this office. We have a TV up in a bedroom. We have a TV uh, down here with maybe a tablet in the lounge. And we have a kitchen over here with a, uh, another uh, tablet. The network has one wireless access point in the kitchen. So this is where the wireless access point is. And it transmits on the 5 gigahertz frequency. I don't know if you remember this, but there's 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi and 5 gigahertz. 2.4 gigahertz actually can go further than 5 gigahertz in general. Or I don't think it's going to be that relevant to this question. When the laptop is in the kitchen, so it's next to the wireless access point, it has better network performance. Explain why the network's performance is lower in the bedroom. And you can see the bedroom is further away through a, uh, through a ceiling, presumably. Can you pause now and try and attempt the question. So I would say something like the Wi-Fi signal is weaker because 5 gigahertz is better for shorter ranges. But in general anyway, the bedroom is further away from the wireless access point than from the kitchen. And since it has to go through uh, floors, it's going to degrade the signal. Next, we have to think about two ways that Hope could improve the network. So, for instance, one of them is that you could install a wireless access point in the bedroom. We could uh, potentially maybe reduce the number of devices. That would make it easier to, to there be less conflict. You could switch to 2.4 gigahertz. Uh, you could uh, change the channel that you're using to make one that's going to work better. So there are several things you could think about. Why don't you consider two of the ways in which uh, Hope could improve the wireless network performance now? So one of the options that could be available is to change to 2.4 gigahertz, but I'm thinking maybe installing another wireless access point would be a good option to go for. Or we could even say, uh, suggest a mesh Wi-Fi. Uh, potentially you could also just move the wireless access point closer to the bedroom. You could make other suggestions as well. For instance, you know, if there were less obstructions, although it's difficult to see here because you can't exactly remove the ceiling, but in some contexts you maybe could you know, there's a wall that you could put it on the other side of or things like that. Finally, we talk about devices on the network do not currently have inter internet access. So there's a LAN, there's a local area network where they're all connected to, but they can't access the internet. Identify one device that Hope can use to connect a home network to the internet. And so that one device would be a modem or potentially a modem with a router connected. Okay, great stuff. Some more questions on hardware on a network. A house has computers in each room and a central router. Okay. Every room allows both Ethernet, so that's wired internet, and Wi-Fi, so wireless internet uh, network, connections to the router. Describe the purpose of the router in the house's network. So you can imagine in a, a network like this, we can have several clients whether that be a laptop or a mobile phone or a gaming console or a TV connected to each other via a central router. And so data is just passing backwards and forward between them. And maybe that's over Ethernet or maybe that's over uh, Wi-Fi, either way. And essentially this data is broken down into these individual packets. So these packets of data are sent via the router from one destination to another. And really that's what the name router, that's where it comes from. It routes, i.e. it directs packets from one destination to another. Routers direct packets from destination to destination. So to answer the question, we can say it directs packets to its destination. Hmm, maybe I should have said to their destination. What else? Well, not only does it direct the packets, it also receives packets from the network or the internet. So it both directs packets and receives packets from the network. 
How about for a final point, you could talk about the fact that routers allow separate networks to connect to each other over the internet. So you could say that we connect networks together and in this case join the home network to the internet. After all, the internet is just a network of networks connected via routers. Identify two additional items of network hardware, apart from cables and a router, that may be used within the house network. OK, we could say a lot of different things here, but I would say a really quick and go-to one would be a NIC, a network interface card. Any device that needs to connect to a network needs a NIC, uh, which will hold the MAC address. Uh, this could even just be a part of the chip, a silicon chip, or it could be a physical card, so a network interface card. Uh, in the last uh, question, we talked about wireless access points, so that could be something you talk about. You could also talk about a switch. We could sit at the center of the network or a hub. You know, actually, switch and hub would just be two separate answers. Oh, and we said a wireless access point as well. So there's a lot of things we could say here. Okay, so this is coming under the idea of connections. In Naomi's office has five computers connected in a local area network. And remember, a local area network is a network typically inside a single building where the infrastructure is owned by the people using it. So a school is a local area network and the ethernet cables and switches and hubs and a white wireless access points are all owned and maintained by the school. Your home is a uh, local area network. So in this local area network, there is also one printer that all the devices can print to. Ethernet cables are used within the office building. Tick one box in each row to identify if the statement about ethernet is true or false. So we've got a few different questions here. Why don't you pause the video and see if you can give it a go now? How did you get on? So this first one here might be tricky for some, because uh, when we talk about protocols, we're thinking about you know transmission control protocol, internet protocol, TCP, IP, maybe FTP, HTTP, HTTPS, IMAP, POP3, SMTP. But actually, Ethernet is also a protocol. So Ethernet, yes, it is a protocol. And remember, a protocol is a set of rules that govern communication. So if you think about it, each Ethernet cable, when you connect it up, it can't work differently. You have to agree on the, on, on the standards in which it works. Ethernet uses wireless data transmission? No, that would be something like Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. This uses wired connection. Ethernet can tr transmit data at speeds of up to 100 gigabits per second. Yeah, you can have very fast. Standard would be gigabit, but you can have very fast versions of Ethernet. Ethernet is a protocol within the TCP IP stack. Now remember, this is all about data passing through the internet, connecting to each other, and absolutely it could form a part of it. Okay, next question. The following table has a description of Ethernet and Wi-Fi. So here we are. Tick one box in each row to identify if the description is more appropriate for Wi-Fi or for Ethernet. So let's have a quick look and see what we think. So we've got a wired connection, so that would be Ethernet, right? More likely to be affected by interference. So the interference we're talking about here would be over radio waves. Think about what it's like using Wi-Fi if you're further away from it. It can be really affected, so that would be Wi-Fi. Data can be transmitted at a faster speed. So in general, Ethernet gives you better performance than Wi-Fi. Which one is wireless transmission? That's Wi-Fi. Shorter transmission range before data is lost. So yeah, Wi-Fi will have a shorter transmission range. Ethernet, if you have a too long cable, will cause problems, but in general, it's going to give you better performance. Okay, we're looking at MAC addresses versus IP addresses. In this context, in the scenario here, a bank uses a local area network to connect all the computers in its head office. Computers in the network can be identified using both IP address and MAC address. Describe two differences between IP addresses and MAC addresses. Uh, as a reminder, uh, let's say you take your smartphone to your school and it uses uh, Wi-Fi that you're allowed to access. You'll be issued an IP address at the school. Now, on another day, you might come in and be issued a different IP address. The IP address addresses are different and are not locked to your, your actual device. However, your MAC address, that's linked 
to your uh, your actual device. So, for instance, at, at my home, my children with their uh, iPads, uh, I use the MAC address to limit their access at certain times. If I use an IP address to do this, then the next time they logged in to the device, they could be issued a new IP address and might not even apply anymore. So what can we say? We can say IP addresses can be changed. While a MAC address, well, that can't be changed. It's fixed to the device. Now let's talk about another way they're used. When you're trying to access a device over the internet, you don't use the MAC address, you use the IP address to locate it. However, when you're actually getting to a LAN and you're accessing an individual device, then you'll use the MAC address. So we can say an IP address, IP addresses are used for routing across the internet, while MAC addresses are used within a LAN. Okay, and now we're looking at protocols. Uh, when connecting computers into a network, the use of appropriate protocols are important. Explain what is meant by a protocol. This has to be one of these bread and butter definitions that you've just got to get or lock down. So what we'll say is it's a set of rules. First part, for how, computer, how, for how computers should communicate. I think I've given the definition before of a set of rules that govern communication. I think that would also be acceptable. Uh, <clears throat> I'm almost nervous not to say this because then people might conflate in their mind but do not get confused with the definition of an algorithm. An algorithm is a set of instructions for achieving a task or goal. A protocol is a set of rules for how a computer should communicate. Okay, let's move forward. For each of the scenarios below, identify the most appropriate protocol to be used and explain the function of the, of the protocol. So let's just take a moment to consider what some of the common protocols we need to think are. So we've got HTTP and HTTPS, which are for uh, the transfer of uh, HTML for web pages. Uh, IMAP, POP, and SMTP, which is for uh, the transfer of emails. And finally, FTP and TCP IP for FTP for trial of fans for, uh, for transfer of files and TCP IP for the governing of transfer of uh, of stuff over the internet. So uh, to recap, we have HTTP and HTTPS. This is for the transfer of HTML files of web pages. The difference is that the S for secure that means that it's for encrypted transfer. So hyper tra hyper text transfer protocol. So let's say you're going on Wikipedia, that doesn't need to be secure, that could be on HTTP. HTTPS with the secure, with the encryption, maybe that's for if you're uh, using your bank. Uh, the next one is, the next set of, uh, of protocols are these ones here. Uh, IMAP is for when you're taking a copy of your email from a web server, so it'll leave it there, but you can see a copy of it. POP is where it's downloading and then deleting the original email for you to see. And then finally, SMTP is when you want to send an email. It's for you sending your email from your local computer up to your web server or from your web server to each other. So that's sending it, simple mail transfer protocol, and these are about receiving your email. Uh, FTP is just on its own, file transfer protocol, so I want to send or receive files. And as we said, in for the final one, we've got the TCP trans transmission control protocol slash internet protocol. So this is the, uh, with uh, if you remember, the acronym for TCP IP, A-T-I-L, ATIL, application, transport, internet, link. This is the transfer of data over a network, or in this case, over the internet. So with that in mind, let's explore these scenarios. A user wants to transfer a file directly from his computer to his friend's computer. Have a think, which protocol do you think that's gonna be? That's right, it's going to be the FTP file transfer protocol. Next scenario, a customer wants to securely log into a bank's website to check her account balance. Again, Pause, have a little think. What's it going to be? 
that's right. Uh, we could say HTTP for a web page, and that would be correct for a web page, but because we want to keep it encrypted, to keep it secure, it's HTTPS or Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure. Great stuff. Okay, we're moving on to network security here. And the bit that was identified that you need to learn about was identifying and preventing network problems. So we need to look at this scenario and we need to evaluate what, uh, what we need to identify and prevent. So a hospital stores patients' details on its computer network. The hospital is concerned about the security of its patients' details. Okay, so what ways could these securities be breached? Identify three errors that the hospital staff could make that may endanger the security of the network and outline a procedure that could be put in place to prevent it. Okay, let's have a little think about this. So, how about this? Could people bring in uh, to the hospital uh, files, maybe malware, on things like uh, a USB flash drive and they bring it into the building and put it into a computer and then it stores the malware. That would be an issue. So how could you prevent this? Well, you could stop external devices being able to be used. So you can literally prevent the USB, in this case, the USB thumb drive from being able to be run at all. Well, how else could you get sort of malware into the system? Well, here's an obvious place. If people went to certain internet sites you could accidentally download malware that way. So downloading infected files or downloading malware from the internet. Now, how could you stop that? Well, you could block or restrict access to insecure websites or even to the internet full stop. Here's an obvious one that you might not think about straight away. A lot of this stuff they're gonna be holding is local, being held locally inside this uh, hospital. Uh, so what you could do is if you broke into the building and get access to the server, you'd be able to see all this information, but it might not be easy to get it externally. So one of the, one of the procedures you want to use is actually limiting physical access to the hospital's network. Now, how are, you going to sort, how are you going to fix that problem? Well, this might not feel like it and sound like an IT or computing solution, but actually making use of locked doors or key cards to stop it. There are other things you could say. For instance, it could be about uh, having, because they've got information on uh, um, uh, patients. Think about the Data Protection Act. You could, end, you could have people accidentally or even deliberately forwarding information of patients to third parties without permission. So that would be another one. So you might talk about blocking access to USB ports to download patient details or not allowing um, members of staff to be able to email or, ex or to uh, upload information of uh, patients to other systems. So the final major topic for paper one is 1.6, ethical, legal, cultural, and environmental impacts of technology. Now, we're gonna really focus on the illegal aspects because this is where you're gonna to need to specify or understand specific laws. In general, remember, it's all about uh, application, sorry, about knowledge, knowing the law, and then applying it to the context. We need to learn about three major laws, and those are the Data Protection Act, the Computer Misuse Act, and the Copyright Designs and Patents Act. In broad strokes, the Computer Misuse Act is saying that you shouldn't have unauthorized use of a computer system. This could be, for instance, somebody accessing your Facebook account with your password and username without you being uh, giving permission to it, or it could be about somebody hacking into a school system to gain access to the data. It's any unauthorized uh, access to a computer system. Copyright Designs and Patents Act, that's all about uh, the intellectual property of uh, products. So for instance, if you copy somebody's music and then use it without permission, that's breaking copyright. If it's about uh, stealing an algorithm and then making use of it yourself, although algorithm is a terrible example because you're not allowed to copyright an algorithm. Uh, if it's stealing computer code though, and then using it, that would be breaking this law. 
Uh, so anywhere where you are basically don't haven't got permission or using an image that you don't have permission to use, all examples are breaking that law. And then finally, the Data Protection Act has eight strands, but fundamentally it's all about the responsibility of organizations and companies to keeping that data secure. So let's say it's a school. Uh, you know, school is holding lots of private information about students. Uh, it should only keep the data for as long as it's uh, is required, shouldn't exceed its use of holding onto that information, shouldn't move it onto external parties, has a real responsibility to keep the data secure, i.e. if somebody came in and stole that data, yes, they would be breaking the Computer Misuse Act, but the school would be breaking the responsibility of data being um, uh, lost. Uh, this is one of the reasons why it was changed recently to the GDPR, it was added in, so that companies can be fined very heavily if they are end up being in breach, i.e. if a company, uh, I'm not going to name any particular ones, but was to lose your personal data, they could have a very heavy fine put against it to, to incentivize them to keep data more secure. Okay, well let's explore these questions here. A law company currently uses a LAN linked to a WAN. They want to upgrade their system to utilize cloud storage. Here are some actions that may take place in the laws company office, tick one box to show which legislation applies to each. So let's explore them individually. So first of all, using a picture for the law company's new logo without the original creator's permission. So is that the Data Protection Act? Well, it's not about private data. Is it the Computer Misuse Act? Well, there's no, uh, there's no uh, unauthorized permission of use of a computing system, but it is breaking copyright because whoever is actually owns that logo you need their permission to be able to use it. So it's going to be breaking this law. A secretary accessing a lawyer, lawyer's personal email account without permission. So this is unauthorized use of a computer system. So this is breaking the Computer Misuse Act. Making a copy of the latest Hollywood blockbuster movie and sharing it with a client. They don't have permission to do that. Therefore, they're breaking the Copyright Designs and Patents Act. Storing a customer's data insecurely, the company has a responsibility, the law firm has a responsibility to keep all data held securely, so they'd be in breach of the Data Protection Act. A lawyer installing a key logger onto the secretary's computer, God knows why you do that, but you're in breach of the Computer Misuse Act. And finally, selling a client's personal legal data to a marketing company without their permission, so this would be selling onto a third party, that is in breach of the Data Protection Act. The vast majority of ethical, legal, cultural, and environmental questions are in this format of a long answer question, which us computer scientists absolutely love, where we have to basically consider the scenario, apply the knowledge we have around law and ethical issues and cultural issues, and then apply it to the context of the question. Truthfully, it's a difficult one to support a lot, but what I would say is it's very important, like I say, to read the problem, the scenario, and then apply your knowledge to the context of the problem. So I'm not going to answer it, but what I am going to do is read it through, and then we're going to have a quick look at the answer uh, answers and about how we might want to structure this kind of uh, answer. So Daniel is a medical researcher trying to find a cure for the disease. He has a team of hundreds of people carrying out medical testing. So what you want to be doing, let's think with our legal hat on for a moment, medical testing, so we must have a lot of private data, so we should be thinking about the Data Protection Act. Uh, is trying to find a cure for disease. There might be issues around the Patents Act. Recent developments in artificial intelligence. Okay, so there might be ethical issues around arti um, artificial intelligence. Means that a computer program could do the work of dozens of researchers in a much shorter time. So, ah, so there might be ethical issues here because you might replace people's jobs because the AI is doing it for them. Daniel decides to increase his use of artificial intelligence. So there's ethical issues here, potentially about um, are the um, clients, are the people who are being researched on, are they going to be happy that robots, are that AI is doing it for them, or are they, going to, are they you know, making decisions about the treatment plans they're going to be on? Discuss the issues surrounding this, considering the following, ethical, legal, and cultural, and it's not being environmental in this case. So let's have a look at how the mark scheme looks for something like this. So fundamentally, it's the first thing you need to think about is which band is it going to be in? Generally being in the top band means that you have considered a thorough understanding of the problem. And by a range, it'll be saying you've considered you know, all of them, the legal, 
the uh, cultural and ethical considerations and that can you apply that knowledge so there's knowledge what you know right so stating the law stating the particular act stating what you know ethically about it and then there's applying it the application to the problem Evidence will be explicitly relevant to this explanation. So they're not just generic, they're linked to this problem specifically and is able to then to weigh up both and finally come up with a decision, like an evaluation about where it's going to land. Let's have a, a little look at the type of things that discussing. So we were discussing some of these. So ethical issues around, um, and these are kind of be, these will come up fairly often, replacing people with machines, which will lead to loss of jobs. Now, if you're losing jobs, community can suffer, work, be, work, but work can be completed faster, maybe even more efficiently. Maybe it means that you can find the cure faster. Maybe there's more reliable co uh, calculations could save lives. Now, it's not in here, oh, but in cultural uh, is that skills might be lost, removal of people from the workforce. It's not in here, but what I mentioned is that people might not be happy being treated by AI rather than people. Uh, uh, need people to manage the hardware instead of medical expertise, change in demand for skills, so maybe you need more computer scientists and less people who can do uh, medical diagnosis. Uh, diagnosis. What about legal? Well, like I say, we're more secure could people seeing personal data, so we have to think about the Data Protection Act and its applications. It might be at risk if it's not backed up, might be at risk of threats of hackers, so Computer Misuse Act, but if they hack into your computers, and they access your private details, you will be in breach of the Data Protection Act. And then who is responsible if there is an error? So if, if there's a misdiagnosis, or the AI goes off and actually gives too much of a high treatment and somebody dies, who's responsible? Is it the person who ran the program? Is it the person who wrote the program? Is it the people who didn't test it out properly? Is it the people who fed in the information? We're gonna find that that's a big minefield in the future is the question about responsibility with AI. Where does the responsibility lie? This will be the same with uh, self-driving cars. If someone's run over in a self-driving car, who holds responsibility for that crash? Is it the driver of the car at the moment? Is it the person who sold the car? So is it, you know, is it the manufacturer? Is it the, manufa is it the software designers who produced it? Is it the testing team for it? If someone's run over, maybe it was a two, two, two decisions. Maybe it was run over this person in an accident or run over this person. It's a real, um, it's going to be a real area of contention in the future. And so, as you can see, it's hard to actually teach this. It's going to be you take the moment really reading the, the scenario, getting your head around what are the things in play, think about it from an ethical, from a cultural, from a legal, from an environmental framework, and then really applying that to the problem in hand, not generic, this problem. And if you do so, then you've got a high chance of scoring a high mark. Okay, so I wish you all the best with this paper one. Uh, you know, stay calm, don't panic, make sure you've read the question. If there's a really tough question you're getting stuck on, put an asterisk next to it, come back to it later. Remember, you know, it's really important, you know, take a breath. Uh, if you finish early, you know, take a few moments, but then go back and check your answers again, okay? Because the last thing you want to do, you don't get your do-overs, need do -overs. this is your one chance to be able to do it, okay? Best of luck, believe in you guys, um, and we'll see you for paper two.